With recent changes to the Supreme Court of the United States, and after decades of restrictions to abortion across this country, people continue to find ways to make this vital procedure safer, more affordable, and more accessible. In this two-part special from Making Contact, we'll look at the current political backdrop. Over the last eight years, there have been sort of a record number of anti-abortion legislation passed across the country. Remember what women have done in the past when abortion was illegal. One of the people that I thought of to ask was a medical student in Chicago. He said, everybody here says, call this number and ask for Jane. And check in on today's movement, facilitating abortions that are self-managed at home. So all around the world, we have a cheap, reliable abortion medication that anyone can get from any pharmacy. Now, the women in Brazil figured out the dosage and, and the means and the mechanism to induce a miscarriage. The home providers that I spoke to spend way more time with clients than would be typical at a clinic. It can be painful, you know, like having menstrual cramps, but there's no pelvic exam involved and you can do it at home. We're not giving out medical or legal advice in this program. Instead, we're sharing an important history and new developments in abortion options. First, we bring you our adaptation of a piece by Hannah Nguyen and State of the Human. It's a look back at the Jane Collective of 1970s in Chicago, told by the Janes themselves. Officially known as the Abortion Counseling Service of Women's Liberation, these women offered safe, affordable, and friendly abortions when the practice was still illegal, and the alternatives were much more dangerous than today. It was just like a powder keg. It was ready to go off. We were so foolish that we weren't even afraid of getting caught. I was 20 years old. I was a, really a kid. I was scared to death. We all were. We were all scared. None of us wanted to go to jail. If we're at risk, we're all at risk. May 3rd, 1972, in fact, the Chicago police from a precinct that we did not work in busted us. There were women screaming, there were women yelling. They asked us, what are you in for? And we said, abortion. And they said, ooh. We'll hear arguments in number 18, uh, Roe against Wade. In the absence of abortion or legal medically safe abortions, women often result to the illegal abortion. And in fact, if the woman is unable to get either a legal abortion or an illegal abortion in our state, she can do a self-abortion, which is certainly perhaps by far the most dangerous. It isn't about population. It isn't about fetuses. It isn't about any of that stuff. It is really about controlling women. I'm Judith Arcana. Um, I'm a writer, a teacher, and of course, I'm a Jane. I got involved because in the summer of that year, 1970, I thought I was pregnant. I knew that at that time in my life, having a child would be terrible for the child and not good for me either. And so I thought, okay, I, I'll have to get an abortion. And um, one of the people that I thought of to ask was a medical student in Chicago. So I called him up. He said, everybody here says, call this number and ask for Jane. I called the number. A woman called me back. She said her name was Jane. Turns out, of course, it wasn't. Everybody said that. Soon I was one of the people saying that on the phone. As it happened, I was not pregnant. And so I called her back to say that I wouldn't need an abortion that time. And she said, we're taking in new people in the fall. And it sounds like you might be interested. Yes, as a matter of fact, I think I am. I really felt that abortion rights were the front line of women's rights because women were, literally, were dying. Jean Gallitzer Levy, 
I'm 66 years old. When I was 20, I was a member of the abortion counseling service. Women were dying from black alley abortions, but they were also dying because they were denied basic medical services that should have been available. Women would go to the hospital with natural miscarriage. And because there was such a stigma to abortion, they would be turned away. Women died of miscarriage during this period. We were a varied group. There were young housewives, people who were older, college students. Everybody coming into the service was trained as a counselor. And you would pick a woman, you would call her, you would set up a time for her to come over, give her a cup of tea, you know, like you would host anyone. And then we would explain what the procedure was. It was enormously empowering. What would happen, you know, this woman would come in, she had this terrible problem, which was, which had the potential to make a complete mess of her life. You know, what she saw in front of her was disaster. And in 20 minutes, that was gone. That mess, that disaster that was sitting right here in her life was gone. And her life was in front of her. It was enormously empowering. And for many, many women in the service, it was the first time they'd really taken control of their lives. It just felt great. Abortion Counseling Service was a context in which to put my ideas about how society should be. So yes, of course it was a politicizing situation. No two ways about it. My name is Martha Scott. Um, I live in Chicago and have lived here many, many years. I was a counselor at the Abortion Counseling Service when I had my first abortion. And then uh, much later on, I had an abortion again, and that was done by a woman I knew. It should be just a normal possibility. It's not what you necessarily choose first, but uh, if, in fact, it's, it's what you need, it's what you need. When you see yourself as a person who is extended around a family, then if you do political work, then you see yourself as a person extended around a much larger entity. Or you're living in a way that maybe makes a difference to the world. That changes you. We were pretty ordinary people. Smart, competent, whatever, but pretty ordinary. And we did a very extraordinary thing. And we did this extraordinary thing because we had a goal and a vision and a group. By the turn of the year was when we also began to learn medical practice. I started to lean on our guy, teach us, teach us, teach us. And little things started to happen. He would let us come in to assist, which really meant in the beginning, sit there beside the bed, because it was in somebody's apartment, you know, there was no operating table. Sit down, hold her hand, stroke her brow, give her some water to drink, whatever, you know, to be comforting. And so the first time I was allowed to come in, blew my mind. It was constant. We did this every week, several days a week. Dozens of women came on those days for abortions. That's what had to get done. I was absolutely drawn to it. Like I said, I walked in, I saw it, I thought, whoa, this is the real deal. Look at this. And also, I think there was an element of learning to do and be competent at something that was important and valuable in women's lives. Of course, now we are practicing medicine without a license. Because, of course, when abortion is illegal, it's not medicine. Actually, what it is is felony homicide, which is very scary. May 3rd, 1972, in fact, the Chicago police from a precinct that we did not work in busted us. So I was working the front. I was sitting and talking to a woman who was very nervous. She had come with her sister. It turned out that she was the person who had turned us in. I really resent that. Later, I heard a knock at the door. So I went down the corridor and opened the door, and there were the two tallest men I'd ever seen in my life. And all I remember is seeing them 
And then I turned around and I walked down the corridor in front of them without saying anything to them. I got into the room and I said, these are the police. You do not have to say anything. They were furious and they arrested me. If I thought I knew how the system worked, now I knew how the system worked. At this point, I'm 28 or 29 years old. I'm married. I have a tiny child. I've been arrested. My dad says, you know, your mother had an abortion. And I was just blown away, not because she did, but because I said, no, dad, I didn't know that. Nobody ever mentioned that. And of course, I mean, if she had lived and if she had been the mother who raised me, she may very well have talked to me about it. I'll never know. So my dad told me the story of my mother's abortion. I loved it. I mean, I don't wish unwanted pregnancy on anyone. <laughs> Never in a million years would I. However, I loved the fact that this work that I was doing could have been, I can't believe I feel <laughs> all these years later, but it still makes me choke. Um, I could have been of use to my mother, my own mother, who was so young. Law and justice are not the same thing. There are many unjust laws. There always have been, there always will be. So I am not one who respects the law. The service was an enormous influence on my development as a human, and certainly, of course, as a woman. Being a mother is really important to me. I wanted to be a mother, and I was but I got to choose when, and I got to choose how. As a result, I was able to have the children I wanted and raise them the way I wanted to. You, as someone who doesn't believe in this, have really no reason to tell me, who does feel it's appropriate, that I can't do it. You have your own choices. Those are legitimate choices. Good luck to you, should you be pregnant for the fourth time or 10th time and you don't want to have that baby. Your, your point of view does not impinge on, should not impinge on mine. And I'm not telling you to have an abortion, and you shouldn't be telling me not to. I think that January 22nd, 1973 would be an historic day. Good evening. In a landmark ruling, the Supreme Court today legalized abortions. The majority in cases from Texas and Georgia said that the decision to end a pregnancy... We thought, well, this is a, this is a battle we've won. Well, of course, it's absolutely not true. In this instance, the Supreme Court has withdrawn protection for the human rights of unborn children. It, uh, it's unbelievable. I would not have expected this. I thought we had gotten past it. The House is moving forward with a plan to ban abortions after 20 weeks. I would not have expected this, the assault that's going on on women's health care. We're looking at an assault on birth control, on basic preventative care on health care for anybody who can't sort of circumvent repression. You know, I've been participating in the March for Life for years, and there's one thing that had always struck me, and that is the vigor and the enthusiasm of the pro-life movement. It isn't about population, it isn't about fetuses, it isn't about any of that stuff. It is really about controlling women. The fewer options women have, the less control they have. Women who have control are kind of threatening to the people who make these decisions, I guess. I mean, nobody wants to give up their power. I don't see women sitting down and saying, okay, do what you want. I think women are going to be the backbone of the resistance. This is a generation of women who were consciously told they could do anything, they could have anything, they, they were human beings. And then in every kind of subtle and not so subtle undercurrent, they were told the opposite. I think we're sitting on another powder keg.
The Jane Collective performed approximately 11,000 abortions. They were arrested by the police one time in 1972. But their case was dismissed after the Roe v. Wade Supreme Court judgment made abortion legal throughout the United States on January 22, 1973. Thanks to State of the Human, the Stanford Storytelling Project, and producer Hannah Nguyen for making these voices available to Making Contact. After this break, we'll explore the current constriction of abortion rights and access, and we'll hear how women are exploring new options beyond official abortion clinics. You're listening to part one of our series on self-managed abortions. To listen to all of our shows on reproductive justice and many other topics, go to www.radioproject.org. While you're there, sign up to get our updates and behind-the-scenes info. Check us out on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, and subscribe to our podcast. If you like what you hear, rate us on iTunes so other listeners can find us. Let's jump back in to look at some of the fallout after Roe v. Wade and explore the current political situation. Roe v. Wade was a historical finding that said women deserve the right to the privacy of their own bodies. What's happened since then is that antis have tried to undermine it. They've undermined it with killing abortion providers. They've undermined it with burning clinics. And now what they've done is that they've undermined it with legislations. There are more than a thousand slashes to the Roe v. Wade bill across the country that have been put into legislative restrictions. I'm Lindsay Z. Comey, and I was the executive director of Women's Choice Clinic, the West Coast Feminist Health Project. So I spent 39 years providing quality health care for women in the East Bay community of Oakland, California. Being a member of a feminist women's health center meant that every day I was able to go to work and provide not only quality health care, but impassioned knowledge to people that were actively seeking empowerment through understanding their health, their nutritional needs, and their reproductive rights. Abortion is not the danger. Abortion is the safest procedure in America. The complication rate is less than 0.5%. There is nothing safer than having a medical abortion. It is 14 times more dangerous to have a baby than it is to have an abortion. That's the truth. Abortion does not cause breast cancer. Abortion does not cause depression. Abortion is often the most freeing thing that a woman can do in her life. Freeing, but it's not free. For many women, the cost of abortion is out of reach, and getting to a clinic is tough when you're young and poor, trans, or undocumented. Currently, about 90% of American counties don't have any abortion clinics. So when women need abortions, how do they get them? It's an urgent question. People, as long as they get pregnant and have unwanted pregnancies, will end those pregnancies or try to, and we'll figure out ways that make sense for them to do that. My name is Nina Liss Schultz, and I'm the research editor at Mother Jones Magazine. One way to think about it is sort of there are factors that push someone towards ending their pregnancy outside of a clinic like lack of access, restrictive laws. Um, And then there are factors that pull people towards ending their pregnancy outside of a clinic. And that might be a history of sexual trauma and a fear of getting a pelvic exam at a clinic. Um, Or maybe the person is trans and really wants to do this personal thing on their own terms. When people use phrases like 
on their own terms or outside of a clinic. They're referring to self-managing abortions. Unfortunately, most of the general public are not aware of the option of self-managed abortions. There are a variety of methods for self-managing, most of which are safe and reliable, often just using simple herbs or medicines. Many advocates say, the focus needs to be on decriminalizing those options for all people, whether there's a clinic accessible or not. People will end their abortions outside of clinics and helping them do so safely or as safely as possible is part of the way that providers think about what they're doing. So self-induced abortion is explicitly illegal in Arizona and six other states, Delaware, Idaho, Nevada, New York, Oklahoma, and South Carolina. Okay. So those are the states where self-managed abortion is explicitly illegal. But people have been arrested in other states where conservative prosecutors can charge people with the unlawful practice of medicine or use so-called feticide laws to prosecute people who have or assist with self-managed abortions. So even if there's a state that doesn't explicitly ban self-induced abortion because, you know, prosecutors have their own personal beliefs about abortion, they're increasingly using things that might not seem like they connect as charges to prosecute people. But there are many different ways that prosecutors can and have investigated and brought charges against and incarcerated people for self-induced abortion. So this great organization in the Bay Area called the SIA Legal Team has identified 40 different types of laws that could be used to prosecute someone for self-induced abortion or for helping someone end their own pregnancy. Um, they really vary. So there's, you know, procuring a miscarriage, which sounds very arcane, but is still illegal in some places. Um, people have been investigated and prosecuted for um, failing to report a death to the coroner, um, for misusing um, fetal remains. Prosecutors sort of throw charges at the wall to see what sticks, like pasta. We'll explore the legal and medical issues more in part two of our program. Over the last eight years since the 2010 midterms, there have been sort of a record number of anti-abortion legislation passed across the country, um, really in every state, um, in almost every state. Um, hundreds of laws have been introduced and many of them passed and they've really run the gamut in the ways in which they restrict abortion. But, you know, they either, um, limit when you can get an abortion. So they make it illegal to get an abortion after say 15 weeks or 20 weeks. Um, or they make it harder for providers of abortion to do their jobs by requiring that they, you know, have hallways a certain width or that they meet with their clients or patients several times before offering the abortion. Trump's election sort of solidified this idea that access to abortion in clinics um, was sort of had reached its peak and was going to decrease, um, access would decrease going forward. And one of the promises that Trump made um, during his campaign was that he would actually overturn Roe v. Wade and would basically make getting abortions illegal. So what does abortion look like when it's no longer legal and also when it's effectively not legal um, and available because of these restrictions. If abortion becomes illegal, more people will probably turn to in-home abortions. Fortunately, self-managed methods have improved greatly over the past decades. And now, as in the past, 
there's a growing movement of brave folks building a network to share knowledge and support. When we look at the underground abortion movement on a worldwide level, what we see is women rising to the needs of anyone that is desires reproductive freedom. When you have a pregnancy and you cannot handle that and you need to terminate it, you need to be able to do that. The reason that right now there's more action is because people don't trust the state. We have so much legislation. What we just saw in Texas with the closure of abortion centers, we see an onslaught of hatred and anti-abortion legislation that has been exceedingly positive for them. We are not winning the reason women are gathering is because we've been losing ground. I think it's very important as a feminist revolutionary that we recognize that we are living in fascist times and that it has always been so that we have been under control as women or trying to be under control. But I have to say that we live in one nation under surveillance and that it's very important that we proceed carefully, cautiously, and recognize that we must step forward. This is not the time for passivity. The earth depends on us taking action and making a stand. If you're sitting on the fence right now, you really just have a stick up your ass. You've got to make a decision and take a step. And learning about your body and taking responsibility for yourself for your reproductive health, that is revolutionary. So welcome to the team because the world needs you and we need knowledge to be shared, not controlled. And sharing knowledge is our goal in this two-part series. In the second part, We'll look at how information about at-home abortions is spreading and how the self-managed abortion movement is developing. We'll hear from doctors, lawyers, activists, and women who have directly engaged in self-managed abortions. I'm Charlotte Landis. Thanks for listening to Making Contact. You've been listening to Making Contact, and you can find us at radioproject.org. Special thanks to State of the Human and the Mary Walford Foundation. This show was produced by Charlotte Landis and Lisa Rudman. The Making Contact team also includes Monica Lopez, Anita Johnson, Salima Hamarani, Dylan Hoyer, and Sabine Blazin. Check us out on social media and send us your feedback and topic suggestions. We'd love to hear from you. Thanks for listening to Making Contact. The Berkeley Film Foundation presents two Oakland documentaries on August 6th at 7 p.m. at the New Parkway Theater in Oakland. Directed by Spencer Wilkinson, One Voice, the story of the Oakland Interfaith Gospel Choir explores how in the midst of a country that still finds itself grappling with issues of race, gender, equality, and intolerance, a group in Oakland continues the rich historical tradition of using music to promote peace, love, and acceptance. Directed by Sergina Ruthblad, The Maze explores the historical, cultural, and environmental impact surrounding of the MacArthur Maze Freeways Interchange in Oakland. This event is a benefit for the Berkeley Film Foundation and is wheelchair accessible. For more information, visit www.onevoicedocumentary.com or contact 510-839-4361.